Hi again, everybody. Welcome to Inside Golf. I'm Harry Donahue on a beautiful day here at Lulu Country Club. Speaking of which, one of its members, Mike Brown, will join us on today's show. He was honored as the Golf Association Player of the Year. Of course, he's the defending Philadelphia Amateur Champion as well. And speaking of honorees, we'll also talk to Chip Lutz. Chip is now a member of GAP's Hall of Fame. What an honor for just a wonderful golfer. And also coming up today, our teed off panel will have a chance to talk about all the discussion of rolling back the ball. Is it gonna happen in three years? The panelists will discuss. It's a big show from beautiful Lulu when it's coming up next here on Inside Golf. The 26th season of Inside Golf is presented by Destination Monco Golf. Your next golf getaway is in Valley Forge in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Visit valleyforge.org. By the First Tee Greater Philadelphia. The First Tee not only helps young men and women become better golfers, but most important, better people. Get involved. Visit firstteephiladelphia.org. By the Philadelphia Association of Golf Course Superintendents, a community of professionals enhancing the game of golf since 1925. Make sure you thank your golf course superintendent today. By the Golf Association of Philadelphia, GAF, celebrating amateur golf since 1897. By Jersey Man and Philly Man Magazine, a digital publication and private business network. Read the current issue free at jerseymanmagazine.com. By the Haverford Trust Company. For life's must-haves, there's Haverford. And by Inside Golf's partner since 1998, the Philadelphia PGA section, the experts in the game and business of golf. Golf is the great equalizer. For many, this journey is an escape from reality, a chance to be part of a team, a career opportunity. PGA Reach impacts lives through golf by lifting people up, giving them hope, and sending them down an alternate path that they never saw coming. With PGA Reach Philadelphia, as in life and in golf, the most important shot you take is the next one. The Golf Association of Philadelphia. Founded in 1897, GAF is the nation's oldest regional or state golf association. We serve amateur golf in Eastern PA, Southern New Jersey, and all of Delaware. GAP welcomes all golfers, junior or senior, male or female, public or private. Join the Golf Association of Philadelphia today. Our mission is always to preserve, protect, and promote the great game of golf. Before you tee it up, look us up. Visit GAPGolf.org to find out more. Welcome back to Inside Golf. Every year, the Golf Association of Philadelphia has a list of honors handed out to various golfers in the Philadelphia area. And the GAP Player of the Year, the William Hydman Player of the Year, was Michael Brown. He's a member here at Lulu Country Club. The ceremony was held at nearby North Hills. And with more on Michael Brown, here's Marty Emino. Well, thank you, Harry. Michael R. Brown Jr. is officially at the door of GAP legendary status. <laughs> Brown notched his third William Hyman III Player of the Year award in 2022 with a year full of splendid play. The highlight, a momentous victory in the Amateur Championship last June. That win made Brown just the third player to complete the GAP Grand Slam. It was also a victory over fellow Lulu Country Club member Jeff Cunningham that came at age 49 years old, one month, and 29 days, making him the third oldest champion in the event's 122-year history. Four years after the last time, um, the perspective's a little different, and I, I kind of am appreciating it from a, a lifelong pursuit um, and, and realize that uh, the, the players that have done this before me are the, the biggest names and the guys that I respected in this area. So um, I just take a lot of sa satisfaction of being alongside of them. I'm, I'm 49 years old, so it's, it was going to be in the next few years. Uh, I, I've, it was tangible that I'm running out of time. Um, 
And as things got closer to the end, it was, it became clear to me that this is probably my shot. So, um, you know, it probably created a little more focus uh, throughout the week. And I didn't play perfectly, but I, I hit some important shots at the right time, um, which, you know, I was pretty happy about. And, uh, you know, to, again, be one of three guys in Philadelphia to have done it, um, it's an honor to be alongside Jeff and, and Chris. So I'm super excited. And, and the amateur itself is, is the one I wanted the most. It's, in my opinion, the most important major that we have. And uh, because it's a marathon and you can't, you can't fake your way through eight rounds. So I'm real happy to have put that one in the book. The Jeff and Chris mentioned by Brown are champion golfers, Jeff Osberg and Chris Lang. A few months after the amateur, the Driven Brown again placed himself in the major championship conversation. In the Joseph H. Patterson Cup at St. David's, he finished regulation tied with 20-year-old upstart Drew Nicholas at seven under par. Both players resided near the top of the leaderboard from the very beginning. Nicholas would defeat Brown on the fifth hole of a playoff. Nicholas drained an improbable 30-footer to save par on the fourth playoff hole just to keep his chances alive. Yeah, that was a tough one to not have won because I, I'm not one of those guys that truly does expect my opponent to make the putt. You know, you're told to, to expect your opponent to make the putt, but I'm also a, a mathematician, so I don't always follow that line of reasoning. But um, yeah, that was a tough pill to swallow. Um, Drew played unbelievably well and hit some clutch shots when he absolutely had to, so he, he deserved to win. All was not lost in defeat, though. Brown captured his first Silver Cross, an honor that's been annually awarded since 1902 and is presented to the player with the lowest aggregate score in the qualifying rounds of the BMW Philadelphia Amateur Championship and the Joseph H. Patterson Cup. Stroke play, to begin with, is another um, form of competition that you can't you can't fake your way through it and 72 holes um, you have to stay engaged the whole time and I did so uh, I, why I haven't won it in the past there's so many good players playing good golf in this area that it's just really hard to win so I'm really happy to have gotten at least one Brown also tied for fifth in the gap mid-am the season opening major in addition, he advanced to the U.S. Open final qualifying and was runner-up in the Pennsylvania Middle Amateur. In the end, he would finish a stunning 345 points ahead of his nearest foe. The Amateur was, will define this year for sure. It was um, an unbelievable week. Uh, I got to share it with my friends. And, uh, you know, the, if you look at the list of winners, the names on that list are the names that stand out in Philadelphia golf history. So, um, you know, that is burned in my brain Thank forever. <laughs> For over two decades, First Tee has created experiences that build character. We believe every kid deserves to feel supported, safe to try something new, and to be prepared for what comes next. We develop their swing, but more importantly, their inner strength. Because we know what's inside doesn't just count, it changes the game. Come join us at First Tee. The Valley Forge Tourism and Convention Board is holding its first ever Freedom from Hunger Drive in the spring. We normally hold it in the fall and we'll still be doing that, but we want to help the soup kitchens and food pantries all across Montgomery County recover from exhausting their resources over the holidays and get ready for the summertime when kids won't be in school for free and reduced meals. No one should have to wake up with the burden of worrying if they'll have enough to eat that day. So help us fight hunger together at valleyforge.org slash hunger. For the Tourism Board, I'm Rachel Riley. Welcome back to Inside Golf. Well, in our previous segment, we met Michael Brown, who was honored as GAPS Player of the Year. Well, now it's time for another honoree to be introduced on our show today. His name is Chip Lutz. He really needs no introduction. 
but just a big congratulations for being placed into GAP's Hall of Fame. Once again, here's Marty Evano. Thank you, Harry. It was only a matter of time until Chip Lutz entered the GAP Hall of Fame. Well, that time is now. Lutz was introduced as the 18th member of GAP's Hall of Fame. His list of accomplishments as expansive as they are impressive. If you're going out of town, it's easy to be a, an expert somewhere and, and not be considered an expert in your backyard, in a sense, because all the local people know who you are, and then they don't really think as much of you, maybe in that regard. But so I've had such great fortune to be become a member of the Hall of Fame at the National Senior Amateur Hall of Fame. I, I've been recognized with the Pennsylvania Sports Hall of Fame. And now to finally achieve my local presence, if you will, as a Hall of Fame member really adds a great deal of honor to me because now it feels like, you know, in my own backyard, everybody will know maybe more about me or be, uh, realize that you know, I'm a part of the Hall of Fame here at home. He was the first to complete the GAP career life cycle. That's winning an amateur major tournament in each of the respective categories a golfer's competitive life spans. He won the junior boys as a teenager, the amateur as a 22-year-old, his first of two mid-ams at age 43, and his first of two senior amateurs at 59. Well, I, I, you know, it was kind of coincidental in some respects because I played a lot as a junior and that kind of spanned from my junior win on into uh, my amateur win when I was 22. So during that phase, I was playing a lot of golf uh, growing up. But then, of course, as things changed with, you know, family and career and things of that nature, it kind of stayed more local in the Berks County area for quite a few years until um, I kind of rekindled my interest in the game, came back on the scene and kind of later on in my mid-am career to actually pick up and, and win the first time out at Tallamore. So that was a, a great breakthrough kind of in my resurgence back with the game and being becoming reacquainted with it and uh, setting new goals. So from that point on, it was um, then off to the races to the senior division when I got old enough because at some point, you know, in mid-amp uh, career, you get to the point where you're almost too old for the mid-amp group because you're starting to play against the younger kids and you're too young to break into the seniors, so you're kind of in no man's land. But uh, the timing was such that I was fortunate to win early and then kind of have a pause and a timeout and then come back in my career later on and win the mid-am and then, of course, the senior to complete that, that lifetime slam. There was a gap, pardon the pun, in Lutz's career. That was intentional. You know, with all things going on business and family-wise with two children, son and a daughter, that it was just too much of a commitment. I just kind of burned out, if you will, of golf uh, in the summer months. So I took five years off. And um, it was really not until 98 when I came back onto the Mid-Am scene and qualified for the first time. First time I ever attempted the Mid-Am, U.S. Mid-Am, I made the qualifier here in Philadelphia. And then for three or four years within the next five or six, I, I made that same qualifier, making it to the U.S. Mid-Am. And that really kind of started to rekindle my spirit of uh, moving to a different level of the game. But it was also really as much of anything, a different mindset. And it was getting comfortable with the idea that I was good enough and that I could compete on a bigger level. And in doing so, it would just take a different frame of mind, uh, a preparation that would be consistent with that and then a commitment to, to go out and play and, and make the best of it. Once he committed, and once he became a senior, Lutz and his game exploded around the world, literally. He won three RNA Senior Amateur Championships, two Canadian Senior Amateur Championships. He was the low amateur in the Senior British Open four times, as well as once in the US Senior Open. He won a litany of high profile invitationals and in 2015, secured the ultimate prize, winning the U.S. Senior Amateur at Hidden Creek with a special guest in attendance. I had been in three semifinals in four years, uh, and that was the biggest hurdle that I seemed to have mentally. 
although I played great, I probably would have won, you know, two or three at least more U.S. senior amateurs had it been stroke play because I had done really well in, in the qualifying competition and, and then through, stroke, through the matches early on. So if it was a three or four rounder, I probably would have, you know, picked a few more off. But I'm so thrilled to have gotten the one because that was elusive. And, of course, my mom showed up and there was no way I was going to let her down. <laughs> You know, that's, that was just so challenging for me to uh, get that one under my belt. And I, and I think being recognized as a USGA champion is probably the highest level and honor that you can have in terms of competition because it's here in the U.S. and everybody realizes how special that is. And, you know, it's great to win in Philly, great to win regionally, but to win on a national level at the USGA brings a great deal of recognition and um, it, it just, you know, I think the best competitive win. Well, Chip, you are definitely one of GAP's best, and now you have a GAP Hall of Fame plaque to prove it. Reporting for the Golf Association of Philadelphia, I'm Marty Emino. Thanks, Marty, and once again, congratulations to Chip Lutz, a GAP Hall of Famer. Stay with us up next, our teed off panel is ready to go and the panelists today will be talking about all this talk of rolling back the ball. Is it going to happen and what are their thoughts on it? That's next here on Inside Golf. So far if they're hitting nine irons in the par fives, is that really a par five? Welcome back. Inside Golf now continues with our teed off panel. We are assembled once again at Lulu Country Club in Upper Dublin. The Lou, as they like to call it. For more information on Lulu and how you can be a part of all the fun up here, and I mean they have a lot of fun, just go to their website, lulugolf.com. All right, we have with us here, we have a couple major winners. <laughs> major winners on our panel today. One of them is Jim Sullivan. He won the Philadelphia Amateur. Last He's the century. last one of the century, <laughs> 1999 when that beard just started growing you couldn't even shave back then could you thanks for having me harry nice uh, to be always here a, and of course he's a member of the lou harry mays major contributor to, to uh, sports radio and the internet he's co-host of swing it and ding it with the moose good to see you welcome great back. to be with you harry and our other major winner philadelphia open 1997 yep that would be mike brown everybody knows mike brown President of the First Tee of Philadelphia does a great job. Thanks for having me, Harry. Good to see you. Um, Sully, I don't know, 99% of us probably aren't affected by it in any way or won't be. Maybe you will be. I don't know if you qualify for the U.S. Amateur or something or Philly Amateur. But uh, the USGA and the RNA recently proposed in some events the use of a bifurcated golf ball, which means a certain ball that doesn't go as far as what these guys are hitting it now would be used in USGA events and RNA events. And um, a lot of talk, a lot of buzz. It would go into effect if approved, what, in three years, 2026, which is a long way to go, but they want to take it and uh, roll it back a little bit. Your thoughts on it? Um, first thought when I heard about it a few days ago was that um, this is you know, what a camel is. A camel is a horse designed by committee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? So you, you get a lot of people with a lot of opinions in a room and you come up with the 2 or 3% rollback of a golf ball that we've been, not me, I don't much, it doesn't much affect me, but the people that are proponents of a rollback have been screaming about it for 20 years and we found 2 or 3%. Now I heard an interview with Mike Wan, where the executive director I guess of the USGA or CEO of the USGA, where he said the goal is to do it now and not have to do it for another 15 years. We know there's going to be incremental increases every year just on bigger, stronger, faster people swinging the club. So I guess it addresses it a little bit. Um, it feels to me like, like, like a very small impact for, for the amount of noise around it. Yeah, it's one of those, it's, you know, it's like inside baseball talk, Harry. This is really inside golf talk a little bit because it doesn't affect the majority, overwhelming majority of golfers. But aren't there other factors other than the ball that have resulted in these guys being able to carry 330, 335 yards. I'm talking about equipment and just conditioning. Yeah, fitness. You know, fitness, I, I think, has know. as much to do with it as anything. Absolutely. I mean, you know, back 20, 30 years ago, guys were, 
you know, drinking beers after a round. Now they go to the workout trailer and you know, with their and bottle of water, exactly, <laughs> and their protein shakes and so forth. So yeah, a lot has, has changed outside of the ball. The faces of these drivers, the the size of the driver head, with the forgiveness, you know, all the way out to the towards the perimeter. So it's not just the ball, but I'm looking for a ball. I don't know about you guys. That gives me a two per three percent roll forward. Or, you know, <laughs> well, if you find that, let I'm me looking know. for ten. Yeah, okay, <laughs> you, I'll, for 10. I'll take three. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, as, from a viewing standpoint, if this happens, maybe this forces some of these guys to create more shots because watching the bomb and gouge can get boring. Yeah, it can. Well, and, and Brownie, you know, par five, three shot par fives are almost non-existent at the elite level of golf. Even in a lot of elite amateur golf, forget about tour golf, would you agree with that? I would agree, the 600 par, yard par five is now reachable. I yeah, mean, I mean, take, it's driver five iron for a lot of those guys. You, you look at, at Bay Hill, they were hitting like eights and nines and wedges in the 16. So is that really a par five anymore? I mean, you go back to like a hoopie where it's a match play golf course, but what is really par anymore? We don't know what par is anymore because these guys hit it so far. If they're hitting nine irons in the par fives, is that really a par five? Would it be better for these, um, the RNA and, and the USGA to consider rather than bifurcating the ball, uh, bar, uh, bifurcating par um, on certain golf courses, like major venues, you know, so that instead of being able to get a home in two on a par five, you're getting a home in two in regulation right. on what is now a par four for a certain tournament, or does that take it too far even? If you're asking me, I, don't, I wouldn't go that route, just because at the end of the day, the score matters. Even if you're playing match play, you know, if you make a three and I make a four, no matter what the hole is, you beat me. And right. in stroke play, if you shoot 71 and I shoot 73, you're two ahead of me for, for the day. On the bifurcation front, there's an interesting thing happened. I'm not real fluent on it, but when, you know, it could be 40 years ago, in Great Britain they used a smaller ball than in the U.S. And at some point it was mandated that the big ball was universal RNA and USGA. And I think it took a number of years, but everybody adopted the large ball because at the elite level that's what they use. The next level down wants to use that and, and it kind of, you know, as you work your way down the ladder, the local guys want to play what their club champ plays, what the club champ plays, what they want to play what the you know, city champ plays, and it works its way kind of up that way. So I, I, don't, I suspect a couple years after the fact, everybody will be playing the same ball anyway. Uh, you, you're old enough to remember that uh, smaller English ball. Yes. And, and it the didn't have the circumference. Had in the US. Remember and, uh, the Robin Hood? Yeah, Supposedly right. it went straighter than what we were doing over here, right? That, that's the one thing I would say, as much as the ball goes farther, the ball doesn't curve like it did. Everything they've done, the shot maker has been taken away because they've changed the golf ball. Rowing it back is one thing. The ability for the ball to curve when you start to hit a certain direction. When I was a kid growing up and you were playing a ballada, he was all about working the ball with wooden clubs. I mean, that was, what, that was where the skill came in. Now, as you said, bomb it and gouge it. The closer they can get, you think of all these traditional golf courses that they would love to play like the majors on and things like that. 2030, what's it going to be like? How far are they going to hit it at Marion? Are they going to be able to drive five par fours? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't care how high you grow the rough. Those guys can still gouge it out there. So they've put the emphasis on the hitting it really far. I think the USJ is trying to make golf courses still relevant. The good places like a wing foot because the dog legs are so far they can't hit it over the corners. But about every other golf course for the, the big tour players has become obsolete. It really has. And Harry, you're still bombing it regardless oh, yeah. of what they do. You're both right? perfect. They roll it back. 240 on a good day. There you yeah. go. And a, hot, and a lot of strong winds behind right, you. Right. May the wind be at your back, as they say. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. We'll be back. More of Inside Golf in just a moment. Designed by Donald Ross, Lulu Country Club is one of the premier private golf courses in Montgomery County. This classic 18-hole course boasts a new state-of-the-art clubhouse with many amenities for members to enjoy. Members are invited to play in events, tournaments, and enjoy guest privileges. For more information, contact membership at lulucc.com. The Golf Association of Philadelphia, founded in 1897, GAP is the nation's oldest regional or state golf association. We serve amateur golf in Eastern PA, Southern New Jersey, and all of Delaware. GAP welcomes all golfers, junior or senior, male or female, public or private. Join the Golf Association of Philadelphia today. Our mission is always to preserve, protect, and promote the great game of golf. Before you tee it up, look us up. Visit gapgolf.org to find out more. Golf is the great equalizer. 
For many, this journey is an escape from reality, a chance to be part of a team, a career opportunity. PGA Reach impacts lives through golf by lifting people up, giving them hope, and sending them down an alternate path that they never saw coming. With PGA Reach Philadelphia, as in life and in golf, the most important shot you take is the next one. That's it for this week's edition of Inside Golf. Once again, congratulations to both Michael Brown and Chip Lutz. Michael, the player of the year, and Chip going to the Gap Hall of Fame. Well done, gentlemen. And next week, we'll feature two more Gap Award winners. The two senior division winners were actually from outside the Philadelphia area. The senior player of the year, Jeff Frazier, is from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And Greg Osborne of Lancaster was the Super Senior Player of the Year. And coming up on future editions of Inside Golf, we'll be taking a little road trip as we hit the road for Lancaster County. What a beautiful spot to tee it up. Thanks for joining us this week on Inside Golf. We'll see you next week. I'm Harry Donahue. Have a great time out there playing our favorite game. The 26th season of Inside Golf is presented by Destination Monco Golf. Your next golf getaway is in Valley Forge in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Visit valleyforge.org. By the First Tee Greater Philadelphia. The First Tee not only helps young men and women become better golfers, but most important, better people. Get involved. Visit firstteephiladelphia.org. By the Philadelphia Association of Golf Course Superintendents a community of professionals enhancing the game of golf since 1925. Make sure you thank your golf course superintendent today. By the Golf Association of Philadelphia, GAP, celebrating amateur golf since 1897. By Jersey Man and Philly Man Magazine, a digital publication and private business network. Read the current issue free at jerseymanmagazine.com. By the Haverford Trust Company, for life's must-haves, there's Haverford. And by Inside Golf's partner since 1998, the Philadelphia PGA section, the experts in the game and business of golf.